Hello, everyone. Uh, warm welcome. My name is Marie Helene, and I'm from Speed Invest. And there is Tobias and Leonard with me. Uh, so we're gonna have a little chat um, about the collaboration of deep tech companies or specifically industrial tech companies with corporates. I think a hot topic, as we all know, this is um, quite a challenge um, to explain uh, the sometimes complex technical details of our products and the benefits um, to our potential customers. So before we go into the discussion and uh, the, the, the fireside chat, I would like to share just a couple of uh, slides with you why we believe that um, industrial tech um, is worth investing into and uh, is uh, a technology that uh, is upcoming. So a few words about uh, Speed Invest. Um, so I'm a partner with Speed Invest and leading industrial tech stream. We have a dedicated fund just investing into industrial tech, um, which uh, is filled with 70 million euros. And um, how we do that and why we feel this is important, we usually try to also support our startup portfolios um, with hands-on support, we really trying to give them um, some, you know, network, some business development opportunity, and um, so that uh, they can grow more easily. Um, how we do that? We have uh, a couple of uh, investors behind us that are traditional industrial companies, so big corporations. And uh, these are um, leading uh, industrial companies from Europe that have an interest, not just uh, you know, in some financial return, but really would like to collaborate and learn from the startups. And uh, so with that, we have a win-win in our ecosystem that uh, the startups and also the industrials, the corporates here can collaborate. This is also why you know, I feel this is such an important topic, how to bring these two worlds closer together. Um, so why industrial tech is, in our view, something that is really hot as a sector. Uh, as you can see, still in Germany alone, 30% of the GDP is generated from the industry, from the industrial sector, but still, and this is recent numbers now from October 2020, only 3% of the whole venture capital investments flow into industrial tech. So on the other hand, we see this in that there is a huge necessity of these um, corporates uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the industrial world to digitize and to spend uh, in their digitization and digital transformation. So this is the so-called S-curve, and we can see that industrials are still um, at the very start of the development curve. And this is also reflected in the numbers. So there is some forecasts on how much they're gonna spend in the future um, in IT spendings. And this is um, enormous because uh, almost 40% of global IT spend will come in the future from the manufacturing industry. So um, there's a huge change in the industrial world uh, on the way. And uh, this is also why there is more and more startups concentrating um, in this area. And uh, this is some of our portfolio companies that we are invested in. Um, and it's a big, big pleasure to have actually two of them today here on stage with me. Um, one is twice and the other one is Celus, um, super successful examples um, out of the space. And um, I'd uh, like to open at this point actually the panel um, to chat with Tobias and Lennart. Um, you see hopefully also on the screen um, the email addresses which I put here. So in case you have any questions, unfortunately, we cannot in this uh, fireside chat um, answer any questions live. But if you have any follow-on questions, please feel free to reach out. So <laughs> let us start um, with a very brief introduction, Toby and Leonard. Maybe, um, Leonard, if you want to start 
just two sentences, what is TWICE doing on one hand, and maybe also who is um, the corporate clients that you usually work with? Yeah, sure. Thanks for the introduction. Um, right, so TWICE is offering um, predictive battery analytics, uh, software that enables you to, to better understand the way that batteries behave in, in any kind of scenario. And that's really important for both energy companies and mobility companies um, for different types of the life cycle. But in general, so our clients are the OEMs of battery powered products, uh, which I think most notably would be automotive OEMs, but could also be commercial vehicles, could also be utility companies. And obviously big industrial uh, conglomerates often, and it's, I think, very interesting to see how, how you can get into these or, or not. Super. So how successful were you? How many, how many of these uh, clients do you already have? Right. So I think we have a bit over a dozen clients at the moment. I think one of the most notable ones that everyone knows here would be Audi, for example, part of the uh, bigger Volkswagen group. Uh, and then we also, um, I have to be careful now which clients I can name, but I, I know that Tier Remote is an Indian company. Uh, that is available, uh, that is uh, having an office in, in uh, Germany as well. They are one of our clients, uh, Vestas, uh, the big um, energy company or rather windmill company, but they also do energy storages. It's another example. And we also work uh, together more in a partnership, collaborative way with TÜV Rheinland and uh, Munich Re. Um, also big corporations and it's uh, probably similar to winning a client to winning uh, a partner. Um, but I think we can go into further detail then after yeah. Tobias has produced Celos. Uh, Toby, how about Celos? Uh, yeah, so uh, we at Celos, we are automating electronics engineering. Um, so similar to uh, how it happened in the software development space uh, with code generators, we bring engineering to a higher abstraction level and automate the design process and engineering process of electronics. Um, which also, uh, similar to the space where TWICE comes out, um, battery systems, electronic systems are pre um, pretty much all around us, and all of them need pretty time-intensive engineering, and uh, that also makes us going into a pretty big, pretty big and diverse space of electronics engineering companies, uh, where we, considering the, the clients we're having, are focusing currently on uh, consumer electronics, the automotive space, and uh, in industrial um, automation. And uh, also have a second part uh, with partners on our platform where we um, combine electronics engineering know-how through pretty much all, all the big names um, most know of from semiconductor industry and electronics component manufacturers. So let us maybe start with, you know, backwards, not in, in the sense with, with the summary. So what, what would be if we talk about collaborating with corporates? Um, it, it's a full bunch of issues and challenges that we have to see, you know, which one to choose, how to get um, the first entry point. Uh, is it the expert level, the C-level? Um, how um, to, to contract with them for a pilot? Um, what are the terms and so on. So there's tons and tons of questions that I would have, of course, and that we can discuss upon. But what is, you would say, in your learning um, in the last years, the most valuable advice that you would give now to other startups with regards to building a successful relationship um, to, to a corporate? Lena, do you want to go first or should I get going? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you prefer. Um, maybe I can. The one key advice I think that uh, that I can give right right uh, right out here is a corporates. It sounds like this big anonymous organization, but a corporation is is uh, a sum of individuals, and I think building that personal relationship ultimately helps you in in achieving something. And uh, if I look at all the clients that we currently have, uh, quite a lot of that is, I think, driven by that personal relationship, especially when you're very early stage, you need to have that trust on the other side because you quite often don't have the solution quite ready yet. So if you get into a regular procurement process, you will have it very difficult to, to actually succeed. So building that relationship is, I think, one of the key uh, success factors. But then obviously, and I don't want to take everything away from Tobias here, but 
uh, I think it's, it's quite often difficult for you to, at the beginning, to identify whether that building that relationship is actually worth it. And one of the more shocking moments when we had our sales director kind of joining was in the very first meeting and everything looked very nice and you had a nice chat and then he would immediately cut in and say, okay, guys, what kind of budget do you have available? How much are you willing to pay for that? And this question, as kind of rude as it seemed at the first beginning, I think is really helpful in really identifying the people that can get you some budget. And I think that is always uh, a key if you're in within a corporation. If There's a lot of willingness to kind of test out innovation, and especially when, once you're in like group R&D functions, and you're quite aware, far away from the core business. And I think you should always be, be careful and mindful that you actually add a value to the client, that it is... Uh, uh, actually, if you're going into a POC, it must add value to the client. So you have something to show. It should be uh, involving some kind of budget so that you are aware that they're also willing to invest themselves. It doesn't need to be hundreds of thousands, but it should be a significant sum. And it should be as close as possible to their core business so that you actually see that you're not kind of a far, far away innovation, innovation product. I would directly go uh, and continue on, on what you're saying because that is actually incredibly important. And you mentioned two parts. One is identifying the real value. And the second, the relationships. And both, I would actually say, are the like, two most important things uh, to really talk about because especially for us in the relationship between heads of engineering and uh, engineers uh, to us, it's also very important not just to identify the value we can bring, but also to really know where they see they bring most value and where they see that they can um, provide the most for their company and their customers. And stay away from that. Bring the, uh, go to the areas that are unique to what you're doing and where they actually tr even try to stay away from. Um, for us, that is uh, the early stages of design process are typically not what engineers enjoy, and uh, also not where they bring most value with um, their experience. And that's why we tend to focus on the early stages in the design process and not go into too much details and in the later journey. And um, that is actually what I would say is the really key thing of knowing how, how to address people and what, what topics they have on, on their mind as individual people and um, really find the, the best fit together. Yeah, I agree. I think that's something that we've all also noticed. And I think the bigger the organization gets, the, the more complex the kind of relationships within an organization are. So uh, when you have like a, a small, medium-sized enterprise, you quite often can just walk to the CEO. They understand the technology. They kind of understand what you're doing, maybe talking to their engineer, but quite often that's sufficient. If you're in a corporation, you often see a kind of a combination of sponsors, could be like startup innovation, uh, program managers, uh, then a business owner, usually incredibly important that you have them on board and they will want your solution. They see the business value in that. And then at least for us, that's always the case. You have a kind of gatekeeper. Uh, for us, that's usually the battery guys, uh, depending on the size of the uh, OEM, you have more or less of them. Um, and you kind of need to either convince them that you add a value to them as well, or that you are so much better in this specific area that you still get the, the thumbs up, but because the people that you're working with or that you're adding value to are so remote from what you're doing, they cannot really assess the quality of your solution. That's what they need the gatekeepers for. And I think you should always have that in mind. And we actually deliberately structured our product portfolio in a way that we can address these gatekeepers in the first step as well to convince them of our capabilities, to get in contact with them, to build that relationship while at the same time addressing, for example, an after sales for us of quality management so that uh, they see the, the more long-term value of uh, having uh, cloud analytics for batteries and optimizing the entire life cycle, while then the battery guys can say, okay, look, these guys actually understand what batteries are doing. So are you, I imagine you have these big um, posters on the walls where you have all the relationship um, drawn. Um, yeah, nowadays it's called Myro, I think. And who is your internal champion and all this. Is this correct? Are you all doing this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 
nowadays it's called Myra, I think. It's you don't have that on the wall anymore. It's uh, Corona times. So you cannot really draw that anymore. But uh, yeah, absolutely. I think it's really important, especially depending on the client. Uh, for for bigger ones, it makes total sense. Uh, we see clients that are willing to buy our solution in multiple areas. So it's not even that one of the companies is only one client. It can be multiple clients at the same time. Um, so yeah, absolutely, really important to know. Also, when you kind of do outreach and you try to target more clients, you should be fairly mindful of the areas where you're already operating with sales and trying to build that relationship. Uh, you don't just want to send uh, more uh, outbound missiles in there, right? Yeah. So um, maybe let's move to another topic as, as uh, we don't have a lot of uh, time left, actually. Um, you know, there is, a, there is always this tragedy of from POC to converting into real um, recurring business, uh, which sometimes is a very long way, which costs lots of energy and pre-investment from your side. Um, and there is this trap of pilot uh, purgatory, um, which means you get stuck into one pilot after the other, but never convert into real business. Um, what's your advice? Um, do you have any tips how to avoid to be trapped in that situation? I, I would say for, for us, there were two very critical learnings into that. One is um, to stay con continuously, always stay in very close contact with a very hard defined schedule uh, that you would define for the pilot and both sides commit on and you stick with it. And the second one, is maybe less obvious, um, make what you're doing and your, your story as easy as it's somehow possible. Uh, it is very easy to say, yeah, they are from your industry, they are in your space, they understand what you're doing, uh, but it's typically, or at least for us and in our conversations, way more complex. It can be that what sounds obvious for us really gives some engineers and some companies a hard time, even if they're already in your pilot. And that is a big learning we had that it's, you need to even go beyond what you think is reasonable um, of simplifying the process and find enough spots so that it converts into um, a real license customer. While at the same time, don't open up too much topics that you will never get through um, and keep it as confined as possible. Yeah, I agree. I think um, the clearer the benefits you generate during a POC and uh, the more uh, structured you have it, the, the easier it is to then expand it into a regular um, project or product. Um, I think the, the, I mean, combining the bits, right? Clear, clear value being at the right spot as well. I mean, there's quite often you, you get at a POC quite easily with the wrong people within a company and they will maybe like what you're doing, but they won't be the right promoters to get it into, into a regular business. So I think you should always be mindful of understanding that. There's, I think, different ways of figuring it out. Sometimes these startup programs can help you. Sometimes third parties, partners, we work with consulting firms to also understand big corporations. They can also help you, guide you through the jungle of these uh, relationships and kind of be with the right person. So I think that, that would be my advice as well. Thank you very, very much. Unfortunately, I already get the warning that we are um, already at the end um, and have to wrap up. So I think as a conclusion, as usual, we see there is uh, human beings on, on both sides of the story. So building personal relationships seems to be uh, one of the key factors and uh, ingredients to success. Um, also in these complex corporate startup relationships, try to work out what is really the value add that your product commercially can give um, to the company, to your potential client. Don't try to cannibalize his core business, but um, try to bring an add-on value on top, um, more or less freeing um, him from the things he doesn't like to do. And uh, when it comes to pilots, be clear on the timelines, on the triggers, when and how to convert into recurring business. So I, anything to add from you guys? Uh, totally 100% agree. You Perfect said it summary. <laughs> Super. Super, it was a, a real pleasure having you. Thanks a lot for your valuable time to spend here in this panel at Arctic 15. Um, have a good remaining afternoon. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you very much for the opportunity.
Thanks, Marie Helene, for the organization. Thank you. Welcome.